we will continue looking at Prandtl's lifting line theory. Uh, we stopped our last recording with this particular equation called the Prandtl's lifting line equation. Quickly to see where this came from, we, we said that Prandtl came up with a model of a lifting line. This is basically the wing. You are just drawing a line through the quarter card. Uh, the wing may be tapered, twisted, planform, doesn't matter. It could even be a curved planform, like an elliptical planform. All we are doing is grabbing the quarter card line from root to tip. And the only thing, uh, from tip to tip, the only thing we are demanding is that it's not swept. It's parallel to the y-axis. And these are our trailing vertices. And they have to, they cannot end abruptly because the angular momentum has to go somewhere. So this is that starting vortex we saw in the thin air foil theory. So all these vertices, either they are bringing in circulation, you know, think of a screwdriver advancing towards the lifting line, spinning clockwise, it's adding circulation. So these are all adding circulation. So you start with zero circulation at the wing tip, you keep growing the lift until the mid-span. Then you start uh, taking the circulation away, so the screwdriver now spins in the opposite direction retreating from the lifting line, removing the circulation. So this is the model plan we propose in our, in our previous videos. Then we took a typical vortex and we said how much downwash is going to produce at a point called P. Then we said in 2D is gamma over 2 pi times distance over, uh, 2 pi times distance. In 3D, because our vortex is only half as long, instead of a 2 pi, we have to use a 4 pi times distance. So vortex is at one point, we call it y. The uh, p is at y naught. So y minus y naught or y naught minus y, depending on where the origin is located, will be the distance we let put. Important thing is this will be a physical distance. Now integrating this over all the such vortices is the downwash. So this is what we did in our previous video. Then we said the downwash, what it does is it changes the approaching wind speed. Instead of the flow coming towards a particular aerofoil section along the x-axis, now because of this extra downwash in the yz direction, this is the oncoming velocity. So the effective alpha is not the quad line to the original direction, but the quad line to the new direction. Therefore, we don't use alpha, we use alpha minus the small angle, which we call alpha i. Alpha is arctan of w over v infinity, which we write it as v, w over v infinity itself, for small alpha i in radians. So Cl is 2 pi times alpha minus alpha naught. Now this is the three-dimensional correction. So lift per unit span is L prime is 1 half rho v infinity squared C times Cl. So just take the CL multiplied by this quantity. Then if you group it, you get this expression. There's also a row here. I kind of forgot to put it in here. So there's a row in here. A is the lift curve slope. It's a theoretically 2 pi from chapter 4. But if you had measured lift curve slope, by all means, use it. So this is the lift from the previous slide. Lift per foot of span, L prime. But Kutta Jokowski theorem says L prime is rho times V infinity times gamma. So this is Kutta Jokowski theorem. This is from the previous slide. Now group everything so that W comes to one side. And then for the W, substitute this integral. Then you get the Prandtl slipping line equation. So the unknown is gamma. So it out, appears outside here. It also appears in here. It appears in two places. So this is an integral equation, not a differential equation. It's not an ODE. It's not a partial differential equation. It's not a PDE like Navier-Stokes equations. It's an integral equation. Our unknown is buried inside the integral. So common technique that we will employ is assume a solution, perform the integration, and see whether it works. That particular solution will be a Fourier series, as we will see then all we have to do is adjust the coefficients of the Fourier series to satisfy the boundary conditions. So how about the drag? We said the lift is uh, tilted backwards. 
So this is the lift vector. So the induced drag is L prime times sine of alpha I should have said. Sine of alpha I is same as alpha I, which is W over V infinity. All right, so this is the induced drag. So as soon as you know the circulation, you can solve for the lift and also for W. Then you can compute the sectional drag, then you can integrate over the entire wing. So the crux of the problem is solving for this gamma from this induced, induced uh, for this uh, lifting line model. So this is where Prandtl started solving math problems. So we switched over to a new video to look at what he did. Lanchester did something similar. He may have used a different notation. So Prandtl, first thing he did was he said, I'm going to assume an analytical expression for gamma. Then I'm going to plug it in here and integrate it and see what happens. Remember, this was before computers, the BC. So they didn't have any, any kind of a CFD. They didn't have a MATLAB. They didn't have anything fancy. So everything was done with a thinking cap on, maybe a glass of something cold by your side, and you put some model and see what happens. So Prandtl, one of the first things he did was, he said, I'm going to assume that this uh, circulation distribution varies like an ellipse from one wing tip to the center of the wing, then the other side is going to be the other half. Okay, so this is a half of an ellipse. Okay. I have only shown a quarter of an ellipse here. We know that the ellipse has got an equation x over minor axis or major axis squared plus y over minor axis squared equal to 1. So here, gamma over the semi-major axis, gamma max, and semi-minor axis, gamma max. Y is going in this direction. This distance is B over 2, so put Y over B over 2, so this equal to 1. This is an equation of an ellipse we know from analytical geometry. It's a nice smooth curve. Now, we are going to change a variable. So what we are going to do is, rather than dealing with Y, we are going to express y as negative of d over 2 cosine of theta. Why did we put a minus? Because when theta equal to 0, you get y equal to minus b over 2, which is one wing tip to the pilot's left. When theta equal to pi, cosine of pi is minus 1. There's a minus here. Minus of minus 1 will be plus. You reach the other wing tip. So you're going from the wing tip another wing tip. So I have changed the variable y into theta. Why did we do it? Again, sometimes change of variable will make integral easier. You have done that in your calculus, you know, integral calculus. Very often when you come up across an integral that you can't integrate, you try to change a variable and see what happens. So that's what Prandtl did. So the important thing is there's a minus here. He changed the y to this way. How about the point P naught? That's where we are computing the downwash. That's the Y naught. So the angle is cosine of theta naught. This is where the delta gamma, the small vortex, is located, infinitely weak vortex. This is where we are computing the downwash. So if you plug this uh, Y in this expression, if you put Y equal to B, B over 2 cosine theta, when you square it, the minus will become plus it will become cosine squared theta, bring it to the other side, it will become sine squared theta, then take the square root, then what you get is gamma y equal to gamma max times sine theta. So you could verify for yourself by plugging y equal to negative of b over 2 times sine of theta in here. So once you have gamma, we can take a differential of it, this is what we get. Why did we take a differential? because in here there's a differential of gamma showing up here. So this is what Prandtl did. Now this is nothing more than a Fourier series, but it's got only one term. It's got a sine theta term. Okay? Remember theta goes from zero, one, one wing tip, theta equal to pi on the other wing tip. Then theta equal to pi over two, y becomes zero. That means you're smack in the middle of the wing. So right in the middle of the wing, you get the highest gamma. 
when theta is zero, you go to zero lift but one wing tip. When theta equal to pi, you get zero lift on the other wing tip. So zero lift of the wing tip, maximum lift at the center. So this is theta equal to pi. This is theta equal to pi over two, maximum. Other half of the wing is theta equal to zero wing tip. So you're going from zero to this one. Sine is symmetric. If you had used a cosine, it would have gone up and come down. So you would have had a positive lift on one wing, negative lift on the other wing. So the wing would have, the airplane would have rolled over. So we don't want cosine term, we don't want cosine two theta, cosine t theta. We only want sine theta, sine two, three theta, sine five theta, etc. So that's what we are going to be using for a more general wing. But for our elliptically loaded wing, we just have a single term, which is gamma max times sine theta. So this is what Prandtl assumed for an elliptically loaded wing. Then he took this integral and he substituted it for dy from uh, this uh, d gamma, this expression. He plugged in for y, this expression. Plugged in for y naught from here. Then when y equal to minus b over two, theta equal to zero, that became the lower integral. When y equal to plus b over two, theta became pi, which became the upper integral. So he analytically integrated this using a table of integrals. Then he was able to integrate this whole integral as this very, very simple expression. This is the downwards at the point p, p naught, which is y equal to y naught. But we realize that this is a constant, this is a constant. So downwash is constant and downwash is uniform for an elliptically loaded wing. That means a wing that's got an elliptical lift distribution, elliptically shaped lift distribution, the downwash is going to be uniform. How can I achieve it? You can increase the car near the root, decrease the car near the tip, Immediately the lift will drop because the lift is proportional to one half rho chord appears here. So that's going to produce an elliptical loading. Or you can increase the alpha near the root, twist it up, decrease the alpha near the tip, twist it down. Then you can also get an elliptically loading. loading. So the designer has got a lot of uh, tools on her hand or on his hand to design an elliptically loaded distribution. So the primary thing we have so far gotten is that downwash is uniform. Now let's compute the lift per unit span, rho v infinity gamma. This is at one section. This is for the whole wing. So all you have to do is substitute for the gamma y, this expression, and substitute for dy, take a derivative of y, it'll become plus b over two times sine theta d theta. So that's all you have to do. So substitute for gamma, substitute for dy. This will go from zero to pi. Analytically integrate it. Okay, this is gamma. This is y, dy. The integral goes from zero to pi. Again, there are tables of integral. So you got a sine theta times sine theta. Sine squared theta d theta is pi over two. And then you'll get a b over 2 from here, so you get a pi times b over 4. Rho comes along for the right, v infinity comes along for the right, gamma max is a constant. So this is the lift that we get. Therefore, the maximum lift, the circulation at the center of the wing, is based on the wing's plan form, aspect form span, the total lift of the wing, density, velocity, all appear in this equation. So the lift coefficient is L by one half rho v infinity squared times S. This is L. So if you divide by one half rho v infinity times S, and the substituting for the gamma max, okay, uh, uh, in this form, okay, this is gamma max. So substitute for the L in terms of CL times one half rho v infinity squared X. Then this gamma max, if you plug in for L, the expression from here, then after some small, some cancellation, you get an expression like this. And you get a span squared in the denominator wing area. This is nothing more than one over aspect ratio. 
So we start getting this expression for gamma max. It's always good to check the units. Gamma max is circulation. It's a velocity integrated over distance. So you should have a units of velocity times distance. Yeah, this is meter per second. This is meter. Everything else is non-dimensional. So we have not made any errors. At least dimensionally, everything is correct. CL is non-dimensional. Aspect ratio is non-dimensional. So now coming back to our W, which is a gamma max over 2B, which we had written here, performing this integral. We just found gamma max, so plug it in there. Okay, So we found the gamma max here, which is actually here. So divided by 2B, then this 2B goes away. Then you get to V infinity times CL over pi times aspect ratio. Therefore, the alpha i, which is the induced angle of attack, which is W over V infinity, simply becomes CL over pi times aspect ratio. So alpha i is a constant for an elliptically loaded wing. If you wonder where did I get this from, you know, you just have to go to a few slides earlier. This is the alpha i. So all these equations are there, but we are seeing them all. So they're going past us in a whirlwind speed but they are there in the PowerPoint slides. So the drag induced at each section is L times alpha i. Remember, this is the lift. This is the angle of attack alpha i. So the drag is lift times sine of alpha i, which is roughly lift times alpha i dy. So all we have to do is substitute for the lift. Alpha i is a constant. So alpha i comes out of the picture so when you integrate just the lift per unit span with respect to dy, you get the lift over the entire wing. Therefore, the drag equal to lift over the entire wing times alpha i. So if you non-dimensionalize it, you get CD induced equal to lift coefficient CL for the whole wing times alpha i. But we already know alpha i is this expression. So if you throw that in, you get the closed form expression for the induced drag. So this is the minimum possible induced drag that you can get. Every other wing is going to have a higher induced drag. Therefore, the designers will try to work very hard to achieve elliptical loading. They will do this by twisting the wing so that you get more lift at one place near the root, higher gamma, less lift near the tip, lower gamma, in between change it into an elliptical shape. You could also change the chord, a large chord near the root, higher lift, small chord near the tip. This is why we taper the wing. So if you look at a Boeing airplane or an Airbus, why do they taper it from root to tip to achieve an elliptically loaded lift distribution? So this is designer's dream. So if you work for Gulfstream or Airbus or Boeing, if you know how to design a wing that's got a minimum induced drag, they'll be very, very happy. So this, for, this is the summary, basically the lift curve. Let's go look at the lift curve slope. Lift per unit span is given in here. We already have said alpha I is a constant. So when you integrate it over the lift over the whole wing, a naught is a constant, density is a constant, V infinity squared is a constant, alpha is a constant, if it's a constant angle of attack wing, untwisted wing, alpha naught is a constant if you're using the same cambered aerofoil everywhere, alpha I is a constant if you have a uniform downwash, assuming all these are constant, all you are integrating is the chord, then you can integrate the chord with respect to dy, you just get the wing area. So this is the lift, lift is this number. Therefore, the lift coefficient, which is uh, lift over one half rho v infinity squared s, just get rid of the one half rho v infinity squared, get rid of s, you only have a naught alpha minus alpha high minus alpha naught. Now substitute for this alpha i w over v infinity, which is cl over pi times a r, which we had developed somewhere here.
see it at Biori AAR. So putting it in here, you get a CL here, you get a CL here. Group all the CLs to one side, then take a derivative. This is the three-dimensional lift curve slope. It's two-dimensional lift curve slope divided by one plus something. So 3D wing is going to have a less of a lift curve slope. Therefore, it's going to produce less lift than a 2D airfoil. So the mystery is solved. We have downwash, which reduces the angle of attack. So we are getting left, less lift. Therefore, when you plot lift versus geometric alpha, then you're going to get a lower lift curve slope than ANR alone because you have this in the denominator. Smaller the aspect ratio, the more the loss in the lift curve slope. So fighter air, airplanes, bomber, will have a tiny aspect ratio, three to five. General aviation aircraft may have an aspect ratio of seven or eight. Boeing 7x7 may have an aspect ratio of eight or nine. Gliders will have an aspect ratio of 20 or something very, very large. So the larger the aspect ratio, the smaller this number, the more you approach the 2D behavior. How about the downwash? Larger the aspect ratio, the lower the downwash. Therefore, the lower the induced drag. So fighter wing airplane bombers have a tiny aspect ratio. They need to be able to roll. They need to be able to maneuver. They need to be able to sit on a ship deck. You can't have a huge span. So they have a small aspect ratio. They have a huge induced drag. They have a much lower lift. Whereas commercial airplanes have a high aspect ratio. Gliders have even more higher aspect ratio. NASA has been looking about all 24-7 airplanes, which use solar cells, stay ups in the sky indefinitely. They need to keep their drag low. They need to keep the induced drag low. That means the alpha high should be lower. So they make the aspect ratio infinitely large, very, very large, 20 to 30 to 40. When you have such a long, flexible wing, it's going to droop like a noodle. So people like uh, Professor Dewey Hodges in our school are trying to see what's happening to the structure, how is it deforming, how can I take that into consideration when I compute this alpha, for example. So this is where we are going to stop this video. Now, Glowert in England, he took Spranos equation and he asked, what happens if the thing is not elliptic? So far, everything is analytically done. So now we have to switch over to numerical work. Numerical work is so hard that we really need a MATLAB code. You could do a small scale numerical problem by hand, but anything more involved, you have to be as a computer program. So at your uh, class website, there is a panel.am code that I wrote. It's available to us. In one of the videos, we will practice using the, running this program on a digital computer, any computer where you have MATLAB. The theory was developed by Glovert. So we are going to go to Glover's theory in our next video. So we are going to stop at this point, the video number three.